Welcome to the Torpreneur Podcast. Travel industry veteran Shane Whaley will take you on a journey with fellow torpreneurs, sharing their tips, ideas, insights, and success stories to inspire you to make your tour business the best it can be. And now, please welcome your host, Shane. Hello, and welcome to episode 58 of the Tourpreneur Podcast, our first of 2020. So, a happy new year to you or Floydin there with that, as we say back in Wales. And if you're listening to this in the summer, because you may just have discovered us, I do apologize, but there's plenty of value in today's episode. Doing something a little bit different today, Chris Torres, you'll know him from the Digital Tourism Show, runs a really good video channel over there, top man behind Tourism Marketing Agency. We decided to get together and have a look at some of the big events that have happened in 2019. And you know, on this show, I really do try and suppress my own opinions about the industry because I built Tourpreneur to share opinions, lessons and insights from tour operators like yourself who are in the front lines. So on this one, I kind of let go a little bit. We talk a lot about the OTAs, the good side of OTAs and the negative side of OTAs. We talk a great deal about Arrival. Chris and I both attended Arrival Orlando. We chat about what we enjoyed there, what we learned. We talked about the big res tech debate that was very controversial. It was a very interesting session. I think it was the session I heard the most about at Arrival Orlando, and that was attended by Res D Peak, Checkfront, and Fair Harbor. We talked a little bit about some of the landscape changes with the big OTAs in our space. You know, Expedia fired their CEO. Oh, sorry, he resigned. Booking.com pulling out of experiences. Are they out forever? Is this a tactical withdrawal? So, you know, we riff over that. We do suggest who is our tour operator of the year. And we discuss that as well as things like Groupon. You know, what are Groupon doing in this space? Are they going to be deep discounting? We talk about Airbnb in this space. And I had quite some forthright views on Get Your Guide Originals. So like I say, there's a lot of big picture stuff in here. So uh, make yourself a cup of tea or a coffee and, and enjoy Chris and I and show notes for today's episode can be found at tourpreneur.com forward slash 58. So it's good to see you again, Shane. Uh, I think was, Arrival was the last time we actually met in person. Your booth looked amazing. You looked like you had a lot of people coming up doing, your, doing interviews with you, etc. So it must have been really good for, for your own show. It was better than I could have imagined. I was a, a bit nervous beforehand because I worked on booths before, but I've never had to organize one. You know, you know yourself being a uh, an entrepreneur, you know, you have to wear so many different hats, which is why I called, you know, my podcast Tourpreneur because you do the marketing, you know, payroll, taxes, insurance, and booth organizing is one. And I'm eternally grateful to Checkfront because they stepped in with Arrival and said, hey, we'll sponsor Tourpreneur at a specialty space. It enabled me to produce content that I would not have been able to do beforehand because what I've noticed with podcasting is if you go up to someone and shove a microphone under their nose, most people get quite frightened off by that. Whereas having prearranged appointments and sharing some questions in advance and making it just a 10 minute espresso interview, just to really get a little snapshot of their business and some of the challenges that they, they face. It was phenomenal. And, you know, you, you put out a lot of content as well as being a digital marketing uh, ninja. You're also a content provider. And when people come up to you, but you must have had this after your book, Lookers to Bookers, where people come up, they shake you by the hand, they look you in the eye and they're like, you've saved my business or you've really helped my business. Yeah. You know, we, we both look up downloads and read reviews and, and they're all great. But when you have that person to person contact, you know, I was blown away, quite frankly, Chris. It's amazing, you know, by doing it the way you did it with your show and allowing people to book up time with it, it's, it's, it's almost like they can psych themselves up before they get there. So if they were a little bit shy or... Know, want to talk to you and stuff like that, at least they can cite themselves up. But in terms of arrival with the, with the book, etc., I know it's the amount of people who came up to me that I've never met before just come up saying, Hey, Chris, no, loved your book, love your videos, love this and that. And it's phenomenal. And, and, and that's what we try to install in our, our own customers to say, Look, content, put out good content, good videos, good podcasts, good written content, whatever that would be, you know, sell your story, show your, your personality. And that's ultimately what will open doors for you. Um, I'm a big believer in that. That's why I do so much of it myself. Absolutely. And I knew about you before you know, I started Tourpreneur because having been a former director at Get Your Guide, I came into tours from the hotel industry and I spent 13, 14 years in online hotels 
tours was very new. So I used to watch your videos to educate me and get you guide about what it was like on the other side and what tour operator challenges there were. So I was very grateful for your content. And, you know, I gave a shout out to our friend Matthew Newton this week as well for his book, Sell More Tours, because that was very useful as well. And I really recommend, you know, tourpreneurs pick up both those books. Definitely. I've got a copy myself. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, he he was saying it's only allowed a date now, but I think the gist of what he's saying is still true. And and that's the difficult thing, I guess, even with your book, you know, two years down the road, the way things are going here in the United States without getting political, some of the presidential candidates are saying, oh, we're going to break up Facebook. So that may look completely different in two years time, right? You never know. <laughs> Well, that's it. But in terms of the, the, the fundamentals of marketing, or where, it doesn't matter the platform, it doesn't matter what it is you use or, or the medium you use. Ultimately, it's all about you telling a story. So that is never going to change. It's, it's, so it's, it's, just, it's just adapting to the platforms that go into it. Um, but no, I, I found Arrival great. I thought it was a, an amazing conference. What I really liked, Chris, was I had some listeners of the show come up to me and say, oh, you know, we were on the fence about coming. It's a lot of money. It's time away from the business. Uh, but we've absolutely loved it. We've loved meeting all these res tech companies face to face, meeting the OTAs, meeting other bike tours from around the country. And nobody came up to me and said, nah, Rival's not for me. Everyone absolutely loved it. And that was really cool to hear because I know we are both huge supporters of Arrival. And we feel that listeners and viewers and subscribers should go and attend because it will help grow the business. And a large part of that for me is and I'm not sure if Arrival really uh, would be happy with this, but I'll say it anyway. For me, Arrival now is almost like a school reunion in many ways, where you see people that you you know you talk to online or you read their posts on LinkedIn, and then you meet in person, you have a beer or a coffee, catch up. And actually, this year, because Arrival's getting bigger and bigger, there were people I couldn't get to see. So Joe Robinson, uh, for instance, who was at Redeem, he's moved now. You know, we were supposed to meet up, we never got time, and there were various others that. The time wasn't enough. So I like the learning. I love the networking. But also it is like having a couple of beers with people who are in the same boat as you. You know, we're all speaking the same language. Whereas, you know, I'm sure when you go to the football or have a beer with friends, they don't really get what we do. To be around people who understand the challenges and frustrations and you can use acronyms that they understand. I love that about Arrival. Yeah, no, no, I'm exactly the same. No, meeting up with old friends and, and making new friends, etc. And that's, no, I think at the Arrival there, uh, between me and Jessica, uh, who at that point worked for me, now works for Arrival. Absolutely. So uh, no, we had about 40 meetings between us wow. just at Arrival. So being able to network, meet new people. And, and most of those meetings were, you no, know, again, it's just part of my ethos. You no, know, we weren't there selling as such. You no, know, we told them about what we did. But most of the people who came up to us was talking about, you no, know, how do I create a better experience on Facebook or how do I attract people on Facebook using ads, et cetera. And I was basically sitting there advising them in most of those meetings. So. And off the back of that, that's you know, we've made some good business out of it. So every year we make new customers from Arrival. So it's to me, it's the it's a go-to event. I absolutely love Arrival. Um, yeah, and yeah. can I just say, none, me and Shane both don't get paid from Arrival or anything. <laughs> we just love true. the event. Yeah. Did you know every weekday Shane curates the most interesting news articles in tours and activities and sends them out in a snappy daily digest? Grab your copy of the Tourpreneur Daily Briefing at www.tourpreneur.com. So what was your one takeaway from Arrival last time? What would you say was a highlight? Oh, well, I think what I heard the most. So here's the thing that was difficult, uh, different for me this year. You know, I had 25 interviews racked up, so I didn't actually get into any of the sessions. However, you know, what I experienced was people who were coming in to be interviewed, what they were experiencing on the sessions. And, and the one that came back the most was the ResTech debate. And <laughs> yes. it was really interesting to, you know, because my show, we're, we're mainly geared towards small to medium tour operators, right? So I mean, the big guys do listen, but it's, it's mainly smaller to medium that listen. And, you know, some of them were like, oh, we were really shocked because you know, we work with Fair Harbor, we love our Fair Harbor account manager, our market manager, support is great. But what we saw on stage was not what we thought the company was. Yeah. And I was hearing that from quite a few different uh, guests that came on the show. So I watched the video, and I could kind of see <laughs> what they were, because I thought, is this being blown up? Is it exaggerated? And that was a fascinating debate to watch. I was, I missed it as well, for exactly the same reasons. I watched the video later and I felt the same. It was, it was almost as if Max was came onto the stage almost in a defensive mode straight away, straight off the bat. 
rather than just sitting there and discussing about how they can push the industry forward. Because in my opinion, they all have a place. You no, know, they all have their own uh, unique selling points. But I, I just felt it was a very much a defensive stance he took right at the start, uh, and it was sort of berating other users or other booking platforms that were there, etc. And it just no, it didn't come across well at all. No, and the weird thing for me is like, I interview a lot of our guests. I think if I go back over the year, most of the guests, you know, Fair Harbor is the most popular booking platform they work with. So, you know, they're doing really well in the market. Yes, that they're aggressive in the market. They've been bought by the booking group, etc. But I don't think they had anything necessarily to come on the stage to be defensive about. It wasn't like they'd hiked up a ton of rates or, or something had gone down. So I was surprised by that stance, especially when you contrast it with Peak Check Front and ResD, who who were pretty calm and measured and just talked about you know how they saw the market and what they offer. I mean, the, the quote that Max came out with, I forget it now. It was something that some elephants die or something, and I was like, no, this is not yeah. that industry. This isn't Wall Street. You know, this isn't an investing conference. The, the cool thing about our industry is we all share knowledge. Yeah, we compete, but we share knowledge. We help each other out. And you really see that, especially with tour operators. I always remember one of our shows, Mike down in Charleston, he runs a ghost tour and he had a really bad car accident, was hospitalized for six months or so. And Bulldog Tours jumped in and ran his tours for him. They're a big competitor. And they were like, don't worry, we'll help you out. We don't want to lose business. We'll run it for you. And I see this throughout you know, our industry that and we'll get on to get your guide originals in a minute because that's going to be interesting how that goes down in the marketplace. But yeah, I, I'm not sure if somebody had coached Max incorrectly or he he didn't read the room was was my opinion. It's a shame yeah. because Fair Harbor do a lot of good stuff. But what I will say is some of the Fair Harbor customers who I spoke with are like, yeah, we're not going to leave Fair Harbor. We love our market managers. We were just taken aback by the stance of the CEO. No, I think a lot of people were, like you say. I think a lot of people were but I don't see it going to affect the business too. They're too big, to be honest. So it won't affect the business that much, I wouldn't have thought. Yeah. And there was that central question. And I guess this is probably why Max felt he had his back to the wall because Bakun weren't up there. And of course, Fair Harbor got bought by Booking. And there was that discussion, should an OTA own a res system, et cetera. And I don't know what you find talking to, to your customers and, and people in the industry, but most of my listeners, they don't really care. No, they don't. <laughs> and I know, I know Pete, Peter makes the case that, you know, why would you let an OTA own your plumbing? And, and I understand it. But most small to medium sized tour operators are like, I don't really care as long as it works, as long as it's a price I can afford, um, as it does everything that I need, doesn't give me any headaches. I don't really care who owns it. Well, yeah, no, I, I agree to a certain extent. You no, know, talking about uh, OTAs, et cetera, it's, whether it's them buying up booking platforms or them promoting their own businesses, etc. I know that OTAs have a place. I think OTAs should be there to complement the suppliers and the operators and everything else to help them generate more business. But what I agree with Peter, Peter Syme in terms of his angle on is, is I think OTAs are now getting to a stage where it's more of a detriment to the industry and from a personal perspective than it is as a, a help. Though a lot of businesses out there are, are looking to grow their own brands and grow their own businesses and actually be a business. But if you are hiding behind a TripAdvisor or a Get Your Guide or, or any of the other OTAs and your brand is not at the forefront and you're also not in charge of your own customer data, then to me, that is a major issue. You no, know, that recent article I wrote um, all about OTAs you know, um, competing on Google Ads against their own suppliers and everything else, it's unsustainable. Suppliers just won't be able to afford doing their own marketing as well as being on OTAs, paying the commissions. Uh, as well as their operating costs, et cetera, et cetera. And all these little things, you know, you're talking about bookkeeping and everything else and the whole tourpreneur uh, aspect of it. It's how are they going to make money? Uh, so something has to change. And it's just unsustainable, in my opinion, at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I come to it from a, a different view. I worked for an OTA, you know, for 15 years or so on the hotel and the tour side. So I've seen how much money can be made by tour operators who work with OTAs and you know, let, let's be honest, you deal with Facebook ads, Google ads, you know, that's not cheap and costs are rising. So if you are paying an OTA 25% and you're getting good business out of it and it's saving you from either trying to learn Facebook yourself and throw a load of money down the toilet, quite frankly, because it's a tough thing to learn. It takes a while. That's why there's people like you around, Chris, that do this professionally or going with a, a digital marketing agency who's promised the world and doesn't deliver. There's a lot of that going on. And then you look at that 25%. I know Peter Syme is right. You know, you've got to look at your bottom line and your profits. But then I do think, okay, how much time should you dedicate to running your own Facebook ads and Google ads versus 
getting out with your tour guides and doing quality evaluation or talking to your customers to find out, hey, you know, how can we improve this? How can we enhance it? What else would you like to see? So I, I understand the dangers of it, but I do also know that OTAs have supported a lot of tour businesses and actually enabled them to... Oh, for sure. Uh, and I'm, I know a lot of people might think I'm completely against OTAs. I'm not. Like I say, they have their place. They do help a lot of different businesses, but I, I know I suppose I come to it from the aspect of if, if a business actually wants to grow their own brand and have their own brand name and everything else being seen in the industry, then that, it's going to be harder relying on OTAs for that because obviously a, a TripAdvisor logo or a Get Your Guide logo or a Booking.com logo or whatever it would be is always going to be at the forefront. But to me, this should be like something like a, I don't know how it would work, but like a non-compete clause. So if you, if you are helping a supplier, you can't run ads against their own ads and that type of thing. So it's, it's, there's, I, think there's, I think there's a lot of things that should, should come into it. So. You see, that, that does happen if you have enough clout. So I don't think I'm betraying confidence in CXs across the board. So my time at Get Your Guide, Empire State Building would come after you. Their, their SEO police and SEM police would really chase you. And I know all the OTAs were threatened with uh, Empire State Building walking away because they were, cause the problem at, a, at an OTA, and again, I haven't worked at Get Your Guide for almost two years, right? So things have changed. It was the same thing at Booking.com. You've got almost this room full of geeks that are locked away in a vault and they're doing all the SEM. So there's not much conversation and they don't want to have like keywords that they can't use because they're running all these algorithms and whatever else. So occasionally you will get an error where suddenly an OTA will be, you know, keyword famous and you guarantee you get a phone call from the managing director saying like, if this isn't off by the end of the day, we're ceasing working with you. So if you have enough clout, then there is almost that non-compete. But a rafting tour or a walking tour or a brewery tour, the OTA is just going to laugh at you. And then the other day I was looking at I think this is the big difference I've seen. So in my time at Get Your Guide, you know, I would scream at them to spend more money on PPC and AdWords for some of our kind of secondary tours, so not the Statue of Liberties and Empire State Building. For instance, Jeff, who runs Chicago Underground Donut Tours, you know, promote that. And I did see a couple months ago that suddenly they are spending a lot more money on those AdWords. Now, I don't know how Jeff feels about that. I'll have to ask him on a, another episode of the show, or maybe he wants to respond to this on, on the Facebook group. He may be happy thinking, well, yeah, I'm paying them 25%, but I don't have to worry about my Google ads. They're taking care of it for me. Or he could be like, no, this is cannibalizing my own campaigns. I want to be in control of it myself. And he's from a marketing background, so maybe he does feel that way. But for a lot of uh, tour operators, you're outsourcing all of that to an OTA. No, and I completely get that. Um, no, from, from our perspective, the, and I don't want to dwell on this too much, but you know, from our perspective, it's uh, driving up the cost of Google Ads. So it's actually becoming to the stage now where a lot of operators, especially the smaller ones, just can't afford to do Google Ads. And a lot of them are now migrating over to Facebook Ads because it's a lot cheaper and actually more targeted, to be fair, but um, it's a lot cheaper option. So it's, it's, it's almost like Google Ads is now going to become just for the few rather than the many as such. So it's, it's a double-edged sword. I can see the benefits, the many benefits of the OTAs. But I also think it's having an effect on the industry as a whole. So it's, it's just finding that balance. And I just don't think the balance is there at the moment. You're right. And I hear the advice, like, just give the OTAs the tours that you're struggling to sell or if it's, you know, a quiet period. But I know from experience, the OTAs will be all over you. If you they, they want your top products. They want your flagship product and they want it on their books. So, you know, it is tough to adhere to that strategy. What I'm excited about with OTA, so last week I was at the America Outdoors conference in Salt Lake City in Utah. Very, very different sector of the industry. It's one that I'm not that familiar with. I'm not really much of an outdoorsman. I don't ski and snowboard, as, you know. But all of those guys, like one guy I was talking to, he was asking me about OTAs. And I, and I had to say to him, look, I wouldn't worry about them just for now because he runs snowmobile tours in New Hampshire. And what I can say is that, you know, the OTAs are not touching new, I mean, I'm sure TripAdvisor have product there, but they're not, certainly not prioritizing it. They're prioritizing New York, San Francisco, Chicago, LA, et cetera, those secondary tertiary areas that they will come in time because the same thing happened in the, the hotel industry. When I started my career in the OTA, I worked for a small British company called Active Hotels. And Active Hotels went on to be bought by a more well-known company called Priceline and Booking.com. But at that time, where Active Hotels did really well and ran rings around Expedia was because they had a system where you could be a small B&B in Inverness and you could work with the Active Hotel system. You couldn't work with the other OTAs at the time because they took money you know, on booking, whereas the Active model was payment on departure. But my main point is Active were able to get into those regions and deliver revenue. That's what I want to see. And I do feel it's just a matter of time. So whether it's New Hampshire or 
Inverness, for instance, it's like, yeah, I want to see the OTAs promoting those areas because the big issue I've heard about this year is actually discovery and how these more specialist tours get discovered. That's the headache. And that's when they do need to use AdWords. But even then, you know, they're going to spend a lot of money to crack that. That's what I'm excited about going forward. Yeah. And it's the sustainability part of that as well. You know, rather than always promoting the, the heavy populated areas, it's, yeah. it's telling people about and letting them discover the lesser known, but equally as great you know, destinations, et cetera, and cities, et cetera. So. Well, this is why I was surprised about booking this year. Booking have basically shelved their experiences team, which was a big shock, I think, to everybody. I still have not found out the reason why. So if there's any booking.com HR directors listening, uh, you guys have done a good job because nobody will talk to me. <laughs> They're all like, no, we can't say anything. And I know redundancies are, are at play and some people are moving within the organization, but that they've clammed up. And the reason I bring that up, because I really felt that with booking, with the data that they have, so let's say I did book a hotel in Inverness, booking knows I'm there. And then they can flash up on the app, hey, here's three really cool tours or activities in Inverness that I may not be aware that there's a biking tour or a particular walking tour or a whiskey tour, whatever it may be. And they're pushing that to me. So that's what I was really excited about with yeah. booking.com. It's almost a natural journey. You know, you're booking up your hotel, your flights, your hotel, and then what can you do? What experience can you take? And it was sort of all fitted in. I mean, and if you think about it, they know like, oh, that person's in Inverness for five days. We might be able to offer them a multi-day tour of the highlands and islands. And I'm sure the others will get there, but I really felt booking were kind of in pole position just for the sheer amount of data they have and they know where you are. Whereas- it was a shock. No, it was a shock. And it was especially when, was it Glenn Fogel, the CEO, was talking about just at Focus Right Conference on the video, he was talking about how they were building that area up. And although I found it quite funny about his quotes saying they mostly deal with, or try to promote the, uh, direct bookings rather than using Google Ads, et cetera, which I, I, I thought the irony on that wasn't lost on me. No. But uh, no, after talking about that, then well, literally a week or two later, or whatever it was, and then they announced you know, they're pulling out. I don't know, if, are they actually pulling out completely or are they just not bringing any new ones on board? Are they still going to offer experiences at the end of the booking and they're just not bringing any new ones? Or are they actually, is that them completely done, do you think? So what I had heard, and bearing in mind, you know, it, this isn't confirmed, but I'd heard that they basically got rid of all their experiences teams. So you have to ask yourself if they're keeping attractions and experience, who's going to be managing those? Mm. But the yeah. press office did say we haven't abandoned it. You know, our strategy is still the same. So we could argue, and again, I have no evidence to offer here, that Glenn might have turned around and said, right, you know, this team are not recruiting a, a product at a speed that we need to compete. We're way behind everyone else. We're spending all this money on stuff. Why wouldn't they just use Fair Harbor? I was just about to say that maybe this is a precursor because they, they're not, the, the agreement they have with Fair Harbor obviously is they bought over Fair Harbor, but they, they treat it as a separate company. I wonder if it's now going to be more integrated and that's Fair Harbor's actually going to be running that part of it. And to me, that makes more sense. Absolutely. And I thought that from day one is that's why they were buying it to plug it in and say, right, now we can have this connected trip that Glenn is often talking about. And I was lucky enough to work closely with Glenn for quite a while. You know, we, we have a good friendship and he's one shrewd guy. I mean, you just got to look at that price line stock price, for instance, compare that with Expedia, compare it with TripAdvisor. And, you know, they, they've done amazing things under his stewardship. And most of the acquisitions that Priceline slash Booking Holdings have made were actually made by, by Glenn. That was his department. So I was talking to a couple of booking people just last week. And what they did say to me was like, you know, that they're really pleased to have Glenn at the helm and he's doing really good things internally. So I don't think they've completely pulled out of the space. Why would they? It's valued at 180 billion. They're sat in all this data. I just think they haven't quite worked out. I, I actually think they couldn't acquire at the speed they needed, which is quite surprising, really, because that was part of my role at Get Your Guide and you know when I was at Booking.com. And for them to walk into a tour operator and say, hey, we have all these people booking hotels with us in your city. We want to offer them your tour. I'm surprised that they weren't able to acquire at a, at a quicker pace. I think maybe them and you no, know, we talked about share prices, obviously, and TripAdvisor, et cetera, lost a lot of shares recently. Uh, or the value of the shares. And I think it's maybe because it's twofold. It's one, maybe they underestimated how hard it is to acquire this market or run it and run in the sort of tourism activities market, but also because it's not like flights and it's not like hotels where it's quite standardized. It's such a, and that's sort of when it yeah. comes to tech, it's such a fractured industry in that sort of sense. And I think that's maybe where they're starting to realize, okay, right, this is going to take a lot longer than what we thought. Uh, they blamed Google. I don't agree with that personally. 
But um, I've got my own thoughts on that. But I just think they've, they've suddenly realised, okay, this is not going to be as easy a knock to crack as some of the other uh, industries like flights and hotels. I think you're absolutely right. See, this is how I view it at booking. I think that tours and activities was like the ugly stepchild. They probably weren't getting the resources because their stock price lives or dies right now by lodging and accommodation. So, you know, was Ram's team given enough resource to actually build what I just described, you know, pushing out tours to the app and things like that? Or was it a case they were feeding off scraps and that's why they didn't grow as fast? I don't know. And again, I have no intelligence on that. It's just how I perceive having worked for OTAs, you know, it's really hard to get resource. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I think it's the resource. I think it's just, like I say, it's a difficult sector to crack. And no, we've got people, I know this is the same with other destinations as well, but you know, you've Scotland, where, I, where I'm from, it's such a has really high rates of tourism coming over to Scotland, as you can imagine. But most tour operators over here don't have websites or booking capability yet, so it's like that, that's why they rely so heavily on OTAs, etc., for that type of thing. Um, so when you've not got that aspect, and people are so far behind in this industry and many destinations, that's been you know, that's, that's why they're often balking at zero point zero one percent, whatever it was at the time and stuff. I know that's gone up since then, but they're just trying to get people on on onto a booking platform, which and that. Part of the strategy that TripAdvisor had, I thought, was a, was a good strategy. Just get as many people onto a, a booking platform as possible and allow people to book online. I agree with what they did there, but maybe it just didn't happen quite as fast as what they hoped. And maybe their shareholders decided, and all the investment they've had, and um, you know, a lot of the shareholders decided, hold on, we need to put the brakes on here a little bit or something. So I don't know. I mean, Glenn's got a, a track record of being quite ruthless, you know, of coming in. I mean, he's come in. The then CEO, Gillian Tans, is now chairwoman. You know, he made that decision quite quickly. So you know, he doesn't hang about, he won't let anything linger, he'll make those decisions quite quickly. So my feeling is they haven't gone away from the industry, they will be back. I think they will plug into the Fair Harbor content and, and start using that. I just can't see why they would walk away from an industry that, you know, they, they need to grow. And it seems to me that they've got nearly, I don't know the percentage, but nearly every lodging in the world, pretty much, right? So where do they grow? How do they grow? They've got car hire, and also on their website, it was kind of hard to find the experiences side as well. So I think they'll be back. Yeah, no, definitely. I don't see any reason why they wouldn't be, to be honest. For, for keeping on the sort of track of the OTAs at the moment, you, you mostly get your guide experiences. And all you, I know you had some thoughts on that. Obviously, you, you used to work there. So. Yeah, I did. <laughs> and at the tail end of my time at Get Your Guide, you know, the whole originals came up. And I was never a huge fan. And, and I'll tell you why. And this was coming from the OTA perspective, not even from a tour operator perspective, but... What I loved about my time at Booking.com, so I managed, I opened up the Scandinavian markets, I then opened up West Coast and Canada, oversaw a lot of offices, a lot of important markets. And I loved walking into a hotel with my market manager and saying, hey, our data is telling us if you have a minimum of eight photos, if you have a photo of the TV and a photo of the bathroom, hotels that have that increase their conversion. And then it was down to the hotel to say, okay, we'll act on that, we'll do it, we'll get someone in to take pictures, or they wouldn't, and that was down to them. And I love that, you know, giving the data to everybody, making it a level playing field and saying, this is what we've learned on conversion. Now, I don't know, because obviously I, I left Get Your Guide a while ago, how that's working now, but there's a part of me that just feels, well, if they have Get Your Guide originals, are they just going to give all that data to their originals partner and not to the rest of the market? Yeah. And that's something that had I still been there, I would have struggled with. Because I want to see everyone take advantage of that data and succeed. And if anyone from Get You Guys is listening, if that's completely incorrect and you're still giving that data out, then forgive me and I apologize and let us know. But that was what, you know, when you start to pick favorites in a market, on the flip side of it, there was, I remember Tao Tao did his uh, Ask Me Anything at Arrival Berlin. And I got my microphone out, spoke to some tour operators. Hey, do you want to come on and share your views about Get You Get Originals? They were like, no, don't want to come on air. We're really annoyed about it. We think it's competing with us but they give us so much business, I don't want to go on the record, which I completely understand, because why would you? But I am hearing from the industry a lot of discomfort around this. And then there was the talk that my former boss, Johannes Reck, the CEO gave, where he was saying that, you know, in a few years time, he wants 50% of their business to be get you got originals. And you just start to think, well, what does that mean? Like, if, if you're running walking tours in Edinburgh, and they're coming in and branding another walking tour, what does that mean for your business? And why should you bother working with Get Your Guide? if they're just going to have that one favoured walking tour? Obviously, they're trying to go along the model of you know, Airbnb or you know, TV experiences or even you know, tours by locals as well, you know, because they, they, they're always branded up tours by locals and they use their own guides and they actually train up their own guides as well and put them out, out there and stuff like that. 
So they're obviously been looking at that model and thinking, okay, but for whatever reason, they like that model rather than trying to be another you know, trip advisor or whatever that would be. So I can see maybe why they're doing it because they're trying to do something different from your trip advisor, et cetera. But you no, know, other people out there are doing it. You know, like I say, tours by locals and Airbnb. So um, it's, a, it's a funny one. It's a, it's a funny one. If, if, you're, if you're just a, an operator who does tours themselves and you don't really want the, the aspect of running a business, then yeah, you no. Know, Tours by locals or uh, get your guide experiences or Airbnb experiences. Perfect. That's probably the ideal situation you could be in and just take a passive income from it. No. But if you don't want to be a, a, an Uber driver as such and actually be your own business and be your own brand, then it's not going to be for you. Yeah. I mean, I get it from a brand perspective as well, because I think it's fair to say there is no brand loyalty in tours and activities yet. You know, there's some global players like Greyline, for instance, or maybe City Sightseeing or Big Bus, but generally... You know, like, you know, I went on a tour in Salt Lake City. I only know the name of that tour operator because we work in this bubble, right? But if I was Joe Public, I would not be able to tell you that it was City Sites who ran that tour. So I think what Get You Gather trying to do is to build the originals up. So let's say I've come to Edinburgh, but a really good experience on a Get You Gather originals. I'm going to Berlin. Oh, I wonder if they have one of those originals tour, the Get Your Guide. I think that's also a route to them building that brand. And, and I get it. You know, they have a lot of criteria in order to be a Get You Get original. Johannes was saying that I think it's their average score was 4.8 out of 5, whereas their average across the board for most non-original product is 4.4. So I get it. They're trying to create a standard, which we've talked about a lot, that hotels have star ratings, etc. We don't have that in tours. So I agree with you it, in, in some ways that it, it's a double-edged sword. I like the standard, you know, creating standards. I get they're trying to build a brand. But in the shoes of a tour operator, I'd be very, very nervous. Yeah, and, and you made a good point there when you mentioned you know, uh, Grey Line and you know, Big Boss, et cetera, et cetera. And all that's technically, and they're probably going to hate me for saying this, but they are technically, for once of a better word, an OTA as well. You know, it's, it's people who buy into the brand, you know, it's like, whether it's a a licensee or, or, or a franchise or whatever it be, you're buying into that brand. But that's people consciously thinking, okay, I want to run my business. I want to change my brand from this to this because they value that brand. So, you know, Grey Lion, et cetera, they're all got amazing brands. They're well-known across the world. So why not? And, and obviously that's what Get Your Guide are trying to do with that as well. So yeah, it, it can work for big businesses as well, but it's, it's whether those big businesses that would want to, if you can imagine like a Grey Lion Orlando, for example, you know, suddenly going, no, we're not going to be Grey Lion Orlando anymore. We're going to be Get Your Guide Originals. It's... It's going to be a hard one not to crack it, I thought. So as I understand, listening to Wilfred Fan at Croak at Arrival Bangkok, he was saying that there wasn't a route they were going to go down. But that could change because all these OTAs are looking. And if they see Get Your Guide achieving success with originals, they're going to pile in. So what are you going to have? Kluke originals and Expedia originals. And it's, again, going to be a very interesting marketplace with everyone picking favorites. Yeah, and no, it's going to be, well, you mentioned Expedia, it's going to be interesting what they're going to do now after <laughs> after their CEO, he says, all, all resigns. So it's, uh, was it Mark, was it Orkenstorm? Is that yeah, how you pronounce it? Yeah. Uh, Alan Pickerel. So it's, that was that was a shocker. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that one. Um, but it just shows you that how, like I said, I mentioned earlier, it just shows you how volatile this, this industry is in terms of them trying to crack it. It's obviously they had a lot of disagreements and some, I don't know what those disagreements were, but obviously didn't align with, with what Expedia are trying to do. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's all tied to the stock price for these big public companies. Once that starts plummeting, then as we know, head start to roll. Barry Diller, you know, he's not, anyway, he's not uh, shrinking violent either. He will, he will take action where needed to protect the business. Want to connect with other tourpreneurs? Then join our Facebook group at tourpreneur.com forward slash Facebook. So I don't know how you feel about the tours and activities with, with Expedia, I don't come across them so much. I don't really come across them promoting their tours. Not many of our guests have really talked about them as a, an OTA that delivers a lot of bookings for them. So I've always, again, you would think maybe they suffer the same issue I discussed with booking where maybe they are not getting the resource at Expedia in order to build this into a real kind of OTA for tours and activities because they've got the data. And the name. Oh, they've got the data, and yeah, and they're, they're a massive company. You know, I think, you no, know, obviously, they're bigger in Europe, I believe, than they are anywhere else. But the, I always remember um, Expedia, and you know, all we back way back in the, the day when we used to develop websites and various other things as well, etc. When you actually looked at the systems Expedia had at that time, and maybe even still today, that they, they were still quite far behind some of the other tech companies, yeah, and uh, that sort of sense. And I think they're maybe playing a little bit of catch up uh, in terms of that. So I think that's what the sort of process they're still going through. I would hate to say it, but that's one of the reasons why Thomas Cook went under. No, they, but they were playing catch up. They left it a hell of a lot. They left it too late to be at the forefront of the industry in terms of 
you think of the amount of data Thomas Cook would have had as well with all the shops that they had and everything else and the flights, the accommodations, the experiences that they had and everything else and the packages that they offered. They should never have went under, um, but they just left things a lot too late. And and I think it's been a, a still going through that phase as well, personally. But Which is why I always felt, and again, I, I don't have any evidence for this, but I always thought Expedia were going to come in and buy Get Your Guide at some point. Hmm. I thought it would either yeah. be booking, would buy them, because at that time, Get Your Guide were an affiliate partner. At the end of your booking hotel, there was a Get Your Guide link. Plus, Case Coolen, the former CEO of booking, was on the board of Get Your Guide. But I always had a feeling that Expedia would come in and buy Get Your Guide. Obviously, that didn't happen, but... Yeah, I, I just that's what I'm saying. I just think that they just do things that a little bit slower than what they maybe should have done. Um, and I think that's maybe why they are where they are at the moment. So, um, yeah, it's an interesting one. I'm, I'm just, I, I've got a funny feeling we're going to hear more from Expedia, for good or for worse, over the next year or two. Yeah, I don't hear much from them. That's the thing. It's like I, I never hear on the tours and activities side anyway. Maybe that will change with the the new order over at Expedia or will they just double down on their lodging product and flights and if, if that has sunk down. I think another interesting thing that I observed with Johannes Rex talk in Berlin where he said, you know, get your guide is number one in Europe, uh, we're number two in the United States and soon to be number one. Now, obviously a few years ago I was privy to those numbers. But there was a big gap, quite frankly. But looking now, for instance, you know, when I was in Salt Lake City last week, I pulled up both apps and TripAdvisor, this was the score, right? It was like a rugby score. TripAdvisor 68, get your guide four in terms of activities. Now, again, Salt Lake City, lovely, lovely place, but I, I'm guessing it's a secondary or tertiary city. I'm pretty confident that get your guide haven't really focused on Salt Lake City yet, which, you know, there's a lot of outdoor activities that go on there. There's, you know, like I say, TripAdvisor had 68 activities. So when he says they're going to be number one quite you know soon in the U.S., I did kind of raise my eyebrows and thought, is that just you know fighting talk? And then you know I'm not privy to the value that they're delivering in their biggest cities, but I'm pretty sure if I did an audit of these secondary and tertiary destinations, that trip would be some way ahead. Yeah, no, I would agree. Yeah, just going back to your point about you no know, speed of you know, possibly buying, get your guide, etc. I know it couldn't help now with the the amount of investment they've had. It's impossible for anybody to buy Get Your Guide. Unfortunately, Get Your Guide are now in a position where they have to make it work or they're going to have to sell it cheap. <laughs> so. Yeah, and you know, I'm being pretty candid on, on this uh, chat today. I mean, I, if Johannes listens, I'm not picking on you, but he also said at Focus, right, you know, yeah, SoftBank are an investor, but they're just along for the ride. And I was like, no, like no one's chipping in millions just for the ride. And, and the whole SoftBank thing, it's like, it's like you and I putting money on Rangers and Celtic to win the title because they pump money into Kluk and they pump money into, into Get Your Guide. So it's a really odd situation. After throwing, after throwing money about, I'm sure we can take some to help promote podcasts and Absolutely shows. Absolutely, SoftBank. Yeah. There's a punt for you. Maybe. Yeah, especially if they're just <laughs> along for the ride, right? I mean, yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> It really is interesting. And I know yeah, with Opposite Nora, you've spoken about Groupon and Amazon, what they're possibly going to be doing, etc. cetera. Um, oh, Groupon are a funny one, in my opinion, because especially here in, in Europe, Groupon are seen and still seen by many as a, as a provider of huge discounted products, whether it's tours or other products or restaurant, you know, like going out for bites to eat and everything like that. And I think that is one of their issues. Um, I know they're trying to really get into this space and grow this space within the tourism activities market, but I think a lot of people will only use them because they expect huge discounts. And a lot of operators just can't provide the discounts that they're looking for. And I think they've got a bit of a, an issue with the brand because of that. Um, they really have got a lot of work to do to overcome their discount sort of look and, and feel to the brand. I don't know if they can pull it off, to be honest. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. But. Yeah, it's interesting because at Arrival Orlando, there was a poster in the foyer, which was something like Groupon, you know, and it was something, I'll have to pull up the image now of the photo, but they said no discounts or whatever else. And I was like, okay, interesting. And I went over to their stand and I spoke to someone who was there and she didn't really know what was happening. And then I said, look, you know, can you get your sales director to call me? I'd love to get him on the show because a lot of our listeners are confused uh, because she was telling me, no, no, we're not deep discounting on, on the tours side. Yet, you know, I spoke to someone fairly recently who's a tourpreneur and said, no, no, they made us discount. And um, maybe they have a two-pronged approach. But I would, you know, I, I would love them to come out on your show or ours and just explain a little bit more about what they're trying to do. But I, I fear you're right. And also what I've heard from our listeners is when they have run deals with Groupon, because I think it used to be if you worked with Viator, you were automatically added to Groupon. There was something that 
people were really annoyed. Yeah, that to Peter Syme, again, to, to mention him. No, uh, he had one of his tours through uh, via tour then, and yet all of a sudden, he came on Groupon, and, no, and it just happened automatically, and it wasn't really the type of customer that he was trying to attract. And I also heard that the discount buyers are the absolutely worst for leaving bad reviews. They're expecting, you know, a lot more quality, whatever it may be, and they're quick to leave negative. And that's weird, isn't it? You get a 50% off a hotel room or an, an activity, and then you leave a crappy review. And I, I worked for a couple of years as VP of sales at a company called Secret Escapes, which I'm sure you'd be familiar with in the UK. So they did flash hotel deals, deep discounts, but only four star and up. And I got talking to a lot of these hoteliers, and they, they won't touch Groupon with a barge ball. They call them the ramen noodle brigade. And, you know, or a pot noodle brigade for your British listeners. And I, I don't mean to be snobby here at all. But what they were saying was um, those customers would come in, they'd buy cans of beer for their room and sandwiches. They wouldn't spend it. And the whole thing about the flash deal is those hoteliers, yeah, they want to fill up some rooms. So they want you to have a couple of drinks at the bar or maybe a meal or a breakfast or, you know, something. And they never did spend money on site. So that which... is the whole point is because it's people looking for something cheap. You know, and that's, yeah, fair enough. That's a, a viable market to go after if, if that's what you want to do. But if you're a four or five star hotel and you want people to come in and take a meal, et cetera, then that is not the customer you want. They are going to just go out and go to McDonald's or bring in McDonald's and have a couple of uh, cans of beer. But other burger chains do exist, by the way, in case there's any. <laughs> but uh, no, it's just, it's not the customer you're, you're going to try, to try to attract if it's a four or five star hotel. No. So that's that's interesting, but maybe they're going to do something different. I mean, let's 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 see what they do. I, they've been very very quiet about it, but yet they must have pumped a fair bit of money into Arrival to be a launch partner. Uh, you know that doesn't come cheap, so maybe they're going to take this seriously. But there's that, and you were quite right to mention Amazon. There was discussion a few months ago, and some of our listeners said they'd been approached by Amazon confidentially. They weren't allowed to say much about it, uh, but I haven't heard any more about that. And I'm reminded that a few years ago of Amazon were going to come into um, the hotel space. And in fact, they were in the United States for a grand total, I think it was of three months. And then they just pulled the plug and said, yeah, this isn't for us. And I always admired them for it. A bit like maybe what's happening with booking where they're like, oh, yeah, this is a lot more difficult than we anticipated. And, you know, I dodged a bullet there because they headhunted me to head up their sales division for the East Coast. And, you know, it's Amazon. I was really tempted. But in the end, I said, no, I'm loyal to Secret Escapes. I'm going to stay. And then a month later, they go. I'm like, oof. <laughs> wow. Dodge the bullet. <laughs> Big time. Big time. So uh, what do you think they're up to? Have you heard anything? Oh, there are for sure. Uh, they're getting into so many different things now. They want to be... For once of a better word, the, the Walmart of the online, which they are already with everything else they do. So they want to bring in activities, they want to bring in tours, they'll eventually come back into the hotel space again. I would be surprised if they eventually do flights and become what Virgin are at the moment. No, they have probably got aspirations for that as well at some point. So they will come back into it. And you know, I've been hearing sort of similar rumors as well of, that they've been approaching certain operators, etc., and, and trying to bring that part of the business in. And, and so it makes sense for you know, if, if the, the, the biggest online retailer there is in the world. So why wouldn't you have something on there where people can buy an experience and give it off to a gift for a loved one or, or just to book a holiday or anything like that? It's, if it becomes a, a one-stop shop for pretty much everything, it's, it's very much like WeChat in America where you can get everything on WeChat. It's, it's, if they can do that uh, in terms of uh, the Western market, then yeah. Uh, and they are going to make that. I, I would be surprised if someone like Amazon would come in and buy one of the OTAs or buy one of the uh, booking systems or whatever it would be. To integrate even more. No, I, I wrote an article a while back, a bit more tongue in cheek, but I still think it, will, it could happen about no Facebook buying TripAdvisor, for example. But that doesn't mean to say Amazon could buy TripAdvisor or or something. They, they have the money to do it, or even an Apple. Even an Apple, I think Apple will come into this space as well. No, they're, they're developing autonomous vehicles that will no doubt uh, bring in tours and things like that, that as well. So there'll be other companies out there that we we don't realize who will come into this space at some point. Yeah, this is, I always say it's like the gold rush right now, isn't it? Everyone's rushing to the West to, to dig for gold. Some companies are, you know, meters away from the seam and, and giving up. And then others are, you know, like get your guide, got to give them credit. They've been around for a long time at this. They have a lot of learning. And I think that's that's the key to acquisition. If you think about it, get your guide. have got 10 years of mistakes behind them. Whereas if you want to start afresh like an Amazon, I mean, you've got all those mistakes to make. Whereas if you come in and buy that knowledge and expertise, 
and that to me that makes makes more sense for Amazon or Facebook or whatever. They're, they're looking at the industry what's happening just now over the last three or four years. They'll see how turbulent it's been and the, the successes as well it's had. And then within a few years' time, they'll go when things maybe look as if it might it might take another five years, but if it starts to get a bit more standardised and things like that, that's when they'll just come in and go, "I'll have that." The company we haven't talked about because they're primarily concerned they're an OTA, but they're concerned mainly with attractions is tickets with a queue. Luke Elzinger's companies, because they got $60 million from Airbnb, which was a puzzler to me, because yeah. it seems to be different from Airbnb experiences, whether, again, they'll merge them at some point in the future. But, you know, well done to the tickets team, because I, I had fears about them. I didn't know if they, they could last with all the money being pumped into Get Your Guide and Kluke and up against Trip. I was a bit worried for tickets, and that's not because I've heard anything bad about them. I think they're a great company, but taking real deep pockets to compete in this space. So I was thrilled. For yeah, them. I think it was at Arrival, they mentioned something like the 150 booking platforms out there and reservation systems or whatever it is. It's incredible. You know, it's, within the next five years, I'd be lucky if there's going to be 25 of them or 50 of them. Sort of about, you know, it's, um, unfortunately, there's going to be acquisitions. Some are just going to fall to the wayside. And there are a lot of good companies to get as one. There are a lot of really good companies out there. And I like the aspect that they are more independent. You know, it's one of the reasons why I like things like Peak Pro and all the other ones, because they are independent. They're, they don't have a Fair Harbor or a TripAdvisor hanging over their head and shareholders to sort of say, right, you need to make this and you need to make that. There, there is always going to be a place for an independent system. But it has to be consolidation. It can't continue with 150 different booking platforms. Yeah, you say that. My, my eye-opener last week was, so there was a massive kind of, you know, exhibition area, vending area. And I was like, wow. So Peak were there. They had a booth. Fair Harbor had a booth. Flybook. And I didn't realize until last week that Flybook actually started out, uh, which was a booking engine for fly fishermen and fly fishing tours. So they're kind of of that ilk, right? So I, I get, got them being there. Um, and then there was these other uh, booking platform guys that I, I, I was not familiar with. And when I was asking around some of the attendees, oh, who are you using for your online bookings? It was two or three of these adventure booking platforms that I want to say like 90% of people were using. No one said Peak. No one said Fair Harbor. It was these guys. And, you know, I said to Douglas Quinby, because we had dinner together, I was like, I hadn't even heard of these guys. Are they in the 150 that we think are out there? So I think by niche, maybe... You know, if you've got someone who's like, yeah, you know, we're just going to specialize on food tours or, yeah, we're just going to specialize on ghost tours. Now, I don't know if that's sustainable as a business. I don't know the margins and uh, and the finances. But I think, yeah, then I could see a, a smaller booking platform working because, you know, you're running a food tour. They understand the challenges. They understand what you need to run that food tour. But, yeah, I, th- I think it will be a bloodbath, you know, and I hate to say this, but... Every time I attend an arrival, I think, oh, you know, what booking platforms are not going to be around this year that I met last year? It's the market economy, it's competition, it's it's what happens, but, you know, it's... Yeah, it's actually quite funny. You know, uh, there was a, a roller banner of all... It was obviously all 150, but I had quite a lot of booking platforms on it. I took a photograph of it. And if they have a similar thing every year, I go to arrival, I take another photograph of it and just sort of see what the differences are each year on you. Yeah. <laughs> see who's dropped off or yeah. mayors or whatever. So, yeah, it's quite an interesting one. What would you say is your your highlight of the year? What, what, what sort of stood out for you uh, in 20, 2019? There was a lot because obviously Tourpreneur started in January of this year. It was a an idea it had for some so time. Did you pass your first year? Yeah, or just about. Got a couple of weeks yeah. ago. No, just about. Um, and you know, when I was at Get Your Guide, one of my frustrations, and I think every sales director experiences this, that you are so involved in strategy meetings. I think 80% of my time now is involved in recruitment because we were building a big team um, that I just didn't get enough time to get out and sit with tour operators. Yeah, I sat with Empire State Building and you know Disney and all of those, but I never sat down with a, a brewery tour, a walking tour. But they fascinated me. And what fascinates me about this space more than any other is if you have a passion for local breweries that you can build a tour around it and you can make a living out of it yeah it's tough it's hard it's not easy at all uh and i love hearing these stories of how people are oh yeah i was a lawyer but i got fed up of all that or i got fed up with in the corporate world now i run brewery tours or a punk rock walking tour of new york and i love what i'm doing every single day i get out of bed with a smile on my face and i think for me that's been the real highlight is speaking to people who are you know happy to go to work happy to build a business they love seeing smiling faces on their guests and also just what's available in terms of technology if you think i was joking with someone the other day about you know 20 years ago in 10 years ago to an extent marketing you'd put an ad in the paper and wait for the phone to ring 
You had no idea if that ad was resonating, whereas you know more than anyone else, Chris. You know, you stick a Facebook ad up, you see straight away, oh, it's not converting. Let's change the image. Oh, now it's converting. Oh, now it's not. Let's change the title. Or all, all of that ninja tricks that you guys do, we're able to do within a matter of days to kind of work out if that ad is effective or not. So I'm really excited about more people discovering more of the specialized tours. Like everyone who goes to New York City know they can get a, you know, Actually, I say that about the Empire State Building. One of my frustrations always used to be, still is, I was there last weekend. I walk past the Empire State Building and I see a big line of people outside. That's just the line to buy a ticket. That's not the line to get it. And I'm like, you've all got smartphones. Just whip up the yeah. phone, use get your guy tickets, TripAdvisor, whatever, like book, at least book your ticket to get in there. Yeah. Uh, so we have a long way to go, even with the, the big names. But I, I really look forward to smaller tour operators using the technology that's out there because let's be honest as well that yes of course you know your business uh, relies on paying customers that are like yeah i don't have time to do it i don't have time to learn it i don't have time to make mistakes with facebook i'll give my money to chris let him go do it but for people who are just starting out who don't have any revenue there's youtube videos you know your channel is like i said at the start of the show you know i learned so much through watching you even when I started Tourpreneur, and I, I always share that I just paid 400 bucks for a, you know, a session with someone. And then the next week, you put out a show that basically covered what she told me for the 400. I'm like, wow, Chris would have just saved me 400 bucks, right? <laughs> so I am excited about this. Um, yeah. I'm excited about more arrivals next year. I think they get better each year. I think they are listening. They're learning. This week, uh, Skift announced that they are having a one-day yes. one day summit for, for tour operators. And let's be clear, because Rafat reached out to me and said, no, no, no. He said, you know, we're not competing with a rival. This is for the multi-day tour sector, which is still a really important sector in, in tours. It certainly is. No, a lot of our own customer base is, is multi-day. You know, we have obviously a lot of day tour companies here as well that we help, but multi-day is such a huge part yeah. of the industry that is a funny one because it's only really tour radar that, ha that are the OTA that helps with that no everyone else hasn't really looked at that market or cracked that market yet so it's um, but the guys at tour radar do a really good job of that side of things and I think Get Your Guide will get in I think right now they want to do day tours with Get Your Guide Originals then they're going to move into multi-day tours and maybe that is something where they, they can be you know I think you know more successful um, the best multi-day tour I ever did was actually in your home country of Scotland I did a Rabbies tour Highlands and oh, Islands cool. and yeah. One of the best tours I, I ever went on. It was just, you know, you sit back in a minibus, let someone else drive, someone else sorts the hotels out, the tickets. For, anyway, I can go on. But so that's exciting. And then also on the back of that, Chris, you know, there was a, I wasn't able to attend it, but there was, I think, a one day event at, or a half day event at World Travel Market this year for tours and activities. There was an, a day at ITB in Berlin. So these are big powerhouse names, WTM, ITB, Skift, who are all now taking our industry seriously it's almost like they're like oh yeah we've ignored this sector and what i love about you know arrival that every year they're getting more and more attendees and you know i'm hoping the skift event draws a good crowd as well because if they don't these people are not going to run the events but i i know and you know from your subscribers and viewers that tour entrepreneurs are hungry for information they're hungry to learn they want to take that knowledge and implement it in their business because there are a lot of empty suit gurus out there that will charge them, you know, a load of money for so-called marketing advice. And they don't understand the language of tours and activities. Uh, you do. You're in the middle of it. You, this is what you do. Tom Cratch at TRK is another that does it. Yeah, Thomas do it. yeah absolutely. The, these are the good people in the industry. So uh, I'll shut up now, but I'm really excited about next year <laughs> and the years after for tours and activities. This is why we do what yeah. we do. No, and you had the nail on the head. Is what is why I put out so much free content. So yeah, I run a business, I run a marketing agency. I I've got staff to pay. I obviously need to make money to to keep the business going, make my wife happy. I've got a wage coming in and feeding the kids. But oh, yeah. um, but the, no, I'm a big believer of in terms of when you're when you're doing marketing, is, is offering as much free advice as possible. I want to see the industry grow. Um, I want to educate the industry as much as possible. Because at the end of the day, people will off the back of that will just come and approach me anyway and ask for our help if we need to, if they need to, etc. I know I understand that we can't help everyone. There's a lot of small businesses out there just don't have budgets for marketing and etc. Or, or using an agency for marketing. So being able to sort of say, look, this is what you need to do, and then maybe a few years down the line, when you are at the stage where you want to you know, work on your business rather than in it, and you do want to look at an agency, then that's we're here for you. But by giving that free advice, you no, know, I want to see the industry grow as a whole. As I've always said, for me, I'm the same. It's, it's, it's the best part of travel. No, no one really remembers the flights they take or the hotel that they stayed in, but they'll always remember the experiences they had in a destination. And that's why, to me, it is the absolute spine and backbone of, of the industry. 
Absolutely. And, and here's the thing. Your book right now, up until 31st of December, look at the book as it's five bucks. That's a pint of beer or maybe half a pint in London. <laughs> yeah, but, well, yeah, I don't know where you are. Yeah. <laughs> I live in Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's, uh, yeah, I thought, again, it's, it's, it's one of these things. No, I don't make money from the book. Basically, the, the money that I've made so far is, is, is basically to cover the print costs because it wasn't a cheap book to print, like 400 pages, etc. So it wasn't a cheap book to print. Um, so, yeah, I thought now um, the print side of it's um, sold out at the moment. I'm hoping to do another print run. I thought with a digital one with Christmas coming up in January is always a busy time for, for, for tour operators use or for most tour operators. Why not stick up for a fiver? And if it gives if, if it helps someone you know, for five pounds and book a few extra tours, then to me it's done the job. So Yeah. I, and uh, you know, I have both versions. I have the, the print version because I'm old school, but I love having it on my Kindle as well when I'm away from the office or if I just want to quickly search for something. So thank you for making it available. Someone asked me the other day on Instagram, uh, are you gonna release an audible version? <laughs> Uh, it doesn't really lend itself to that because there's pictures and guides and workshops within it. So yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think someone having 400 pages of listening to me do a, an audio thing might work too well, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe it will, but uh, I would need to probably use a translator for it as well if that was the case. <laughs> well, that's, that's what I said to, to her. I said, well, I dip in and out of your book. I don't read it cover to cover it'll be like oh i need to do some work on instagram and let me go and read up on that or That's you know true. wordpress broke up into those sections so you can do that so yeah absolutely so thank you for writing it because i i rely on it a lot not at all not at all no i'd like to uh also sort of mention them um, no, for what you guys do and, and the two does know it's i don't listen to that many podcasts but yours is one i listen to religiously and i think um without giving you a big head or anything i think what you're doing in industry and no, Giving to operators advice uh, and everything else, it's uh, it's required and it's needed, and I, I commend you for it. And uh, I know you're looking at doing it for a year, and I know you've, you're now going to be doing it for another year, etc. And everything else. So hopefully, fingers crossed, you can you can continue it and keep it going. So. Yeah, the the plan is, you know, we recruit some sponsors because obviously, like you said, got to keep family happy and put food on the table and everything else. You know, as much as I love doing this, I can't really afford, you know, another expensive hobby. Um, but yeah, I just think that, you know, what I'm trying to do with the podcast is, you know, Chris, you, you are an expert in your field. You pay, people pay you to market their tours and activities. I've always worked for an OTA. I've not run my own tour business. So what I try and do on the tourpreneur show is the guest is the expert. The guest is the guru. I want to help flatten the learning curve by sharing someone's challenges or a nightmare situation they had or how they got started. And I think the most encouraging thing for me is... The amount of people who write and say, hey, you know what? I've been thinking of running my own tour for years. I wasn't sure how to go about it. I love listening to your show. You know, I'm planning on launching next year. What I call tourpreneurs in waiting because, you know, the great thing about, you know, capitalism and, and market economy and the free market is we have the tools to do this and we have the tools to get out there and make a living doing what we love. You know, we're, you know I, I read a lot online about people, the doom and gloom merchants and stuff going on in the world but when you look at the economy and the tools we have we can build a business it's not easy it's tough i know many fail but the tools are out there and the knowledge is out there that will enable us to, to make a living doing something we love yeah no definitely yeah and i can't wait for the tourpreneur global event to happen at some point when you bring it all together <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what i leave the experts like douglas and bruce and alex to do events like you know that's uh i'm more than happy to support all the the tour operator events that are out there but i appreciate the vote of confidence never miss an episode of the show subscribe at tourpreneur.com forward slash subscribe so uh, I, like, I would like to finish on sort of um uh, who i would select but with all the tour operators you've spoke to or seen uh, over the last 12 months, who's been your most outstanding tour operator that you've came across so far, you would think? You know, I think I, I think we're going to pick the same one here, and that's Invisible Cities. <laughs> yeah, I, I just, exactly I was going to pick. Yeah. You know, and I love what Zakia is doing. I love her passion for this. She's not doing it to be a celebrity. She really believes in her mission. And the fact that they donate 100% of their profits back. You know, not 50%, 70%, it's 100% of their profits back. Um, it's really hard not to be motivated by that and inspired by it. So that that's one I'd pick. And then and I think the other one, actually, um, just to put another one in there, is, is Jesse at Walk on the Wild Side Tours in New York City because, you know, he was telling me he loves music, he loves punk, post-punk and all that, and he's built his own tour around walking tours around these sites in New York which is a very expensive place to live. 
And, you know, I went on the tour with him and he said, yeah, you know, I, I'm making profit now. Now I'm making a living. It's taken me eight months. And, you know, I take my hat off to, to him because, you know, it, it's hard work. It's, it's lonely what we do. It can be quite isolating because our friends don't understand our industry. So, yeah, I mean, all the tour opener guests are great. That could be wrong. But that story kind of resonated with me. I think, wow, he's taking his passion for music, built a business around it, making a living in New York City, one of the most expensive cities in the world. Yeah. And that's when you make the most successful tours. It's when it's something you're passionate about. You can tell good stories, you know, to highlight the experience. And but that, to me, that's a, from a marketing company's point of view, that's an absolute dream to work with because that's what you want. You know? um, but no, I agree with the first one, uh, Invisible Cities. And, and for anyone listening or watching who doesn't know who Invisible Cities are, watch the Arrival video uh, that they posted up. Um, she was one of the first speakers who Zakia basically takes homeless people, turn, turns them into tour guys and basically gives them a life back. And I, I know for a fact that after that speech at Arrival, the amount of people who came up to her uh, and spoke to her through that whole event was incredible. Um, and the amount of awards that she has won this last year as well has been well justified. So it's uh, it's, a, it's a company I keep watching. I love what she's doing and long may it continue. What I like about Zakir, she's honest. She doesn't BS. She says, you know, yeah, sometimes it's tough to get those guys to turn up on time and, and you know, look presentable because, you know, that's the, but, you know, she's honest about that. It's, in, to quote her, she said, it's bloody hard. And that's why I admire her as well. She's not getting up like a Gwyneth Paltrow saying, you know, this is like unicorn poop or whatever. You know, yeah. she's really saying, yeah, this is, <laughs> sorry, Gwyneth. I know you listen to the show and Chris Martin. I don't like Coldplay. Um, <laughs> you, you, you and me both ah, brilliant no uh but no I, I respect the fact she's being honest about how tough it is yeah no no true he's exactly. and no, no I, I all credit to her no she's it's a very very hard job but no giving people their life back is is such an incredible thing and doing it in a way that the thing i like about what she does with the business is it's, it's not a charity it's actually set up as a proper business so it gives the people that she's helping um, a sense of security because it's, it's seen as a job, not as a, a handout, as it were. So it's it's incredible. I'm a big, big, big fan. Big, big I'm fan. Uh, excited. I, I'm chatting to her shortly because I want that inspiration. You know, January can be a tough month, right? You've had Christmas, New Year, and it's like back to it. I, I want to start the year with some inspiration. And I just, I, I don't think there's anyone who can beat her right now in our space for inspiration. Especially story. just after the Christmas and New Year period, you know, especially with a lot of homeless people. That's, yeah. that's going to be a, that, there should be some good stories and things I like to tell from that one. So. Yeah, absolutely. So finally, what would you say is your, what are you looking forward to in 2020? What do you think is going to happen in the next oh. year? Really tough question. I don't know. I think there's going to, I, I think I agree with you. I think there's going to be more acquisition news. I think it's going to be a lot more of it than it has been over the last couple of years. I think 2020 is going to see a massive amount of acquisitions and some surprising people coming in, whether it's a, an Amazon or something along that sort of lines, coming in and buying one of the systems or yeah. one of the, the OTAs or whatever. I think I think it's going to be a big shake-up in 2020, personally. I also hope, and again, I know this is really difficult for tour operators to offer, but I would love to see dynamic pricing coming in as well this year. You know, I just think there's such a big opportunity there to, you know, sell spaces on your bus when you're quiet and, you know, have a premium price when you're busy. Uh, again, I know this is really, really hard in terms of the technology and if, but I would love to see that come in. Yeah, no, definitely. But again, that's why a lot of the OTAs are having issues. It's nothing standardized at the moment. Um, the industry really needs to have a more standardized system. And I know a lot of the booking platforms might not like that, but there has to be something to standardize the industry like it did with flights and like it did with hotels it's going to get to a stage where it can't grow any further or it's always going to be sort of left behind and compared to the other industries so it has to something has to happen and over the next couple of years hopefully that will that will happen at some point so the other thing i'd like to see happen maybe a bit controversial is i i would like to see airbnb become a proper ota you know all these policies they have about minimums and you can only take air which they turn a blind eye to a lot of the you know you can only take airbnb you know, they're, again, they're sat on a lot of data. And I'm thinking of the tour operator out there, particularly those who have more specialist tours, you know, using Airbnb. I know they're being very picky who they're working with. I'm like, oh, come on, just be an OTA. You know, you can still curate and have something slightly different than the main OTAs, but I really would like to see them just become an OTA. No, I agree. Uh, and to, I'll, I'll put my hands up anywhere I'm going in a destination. The first place I look at is Airbnb. But I, I haven't bought an experience on Airbnb yet, but certainly for accommodation, it's the first place I look at. But no, I think they, they're sitting on a little gold mine there. If they just, they, all they need to do is push that button and they can really blow up and grow. I, I think you're right. And I think, you know, we're, as I said, the big pain point I've heard about in 2019, we'll hear it again next year, is discovery. How do my tours get discovered? And they could play a huge part in that. 
And to be fair enough, booking you know, are moving more out of the experience space. That opens the door for Airbnb, in my opinion. So why not push the button on it? So I agree. It's going to be interesting times, that's for sure. Definitely. That's why we do what we do. Every morning I wake up and I write the brief. It's like, okay, what, what's happened today? You know, who's resigned? You know, who's been bought? What new tours are out there? You know, it's it's just such a, I, and I know it, it can be a frustrating industry to make money at as well, but it's, I, I, I can't see myself ever working in another industry. And especially like you say, what we do is best part of travel as well. So it's exciting. Oh, for sure. No, I'm the same. It's, I'm so ingrained in this industry now, so invested in it, and I love it. It's, yeah, it'd be hard to, hard to work in anything else. Definitely. <laughs> well, Shane, it's been an absolute pleasure. We need to do this more often. I think, I think you're right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, doing, doing about, maybe every every six months or something, like that, we'll do a little review of what's happened, at least, or something like that. And combine our forces and do another wee mashup. I think, I think that'd, that'd be, be, I think that'd be great. And, uh, you know, what, what do the listeners think? That's the important thing. Just like with tours asking guests, have Chris and I, you know, rabbited on too much here and rambled or have you enjoyed it? Let us know on our respective social media channels. Cause, uh, that's what puts gas, sorry, petrol in our tanks, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. D- diesel were unleaded. That's what we know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, even my son, he, he obviously, uh, my son's going to be four in January and he, he, uh, as, as any kid is, is glued to their iPad, etc. Uh, and he's, he, I went to the petrol station. He said, are you putting gas in the car? And I'm like, oh God, no, <laughs> Oh, he's watching too many American shows, etc. I was like, oh, right, okay. <laughs> it's true. It's true. If he starts, if he starts spell, spelling color without the U, I'll be, I'll be mightily unhappy. So. <laughs> I hear you. I have to be careful. I'm an American citizen now, so you know I have to adhere to yeah. both. I have to be bilingual. Of course, no, of course. No, and I, I'm, I only, I only kid. But no, yeah. we did invent. Well, saying up, yeah. I was going to say we did invent the. the the language first, but Scots didn't. It was really English. So <laughs> even, even, even we don't speak proper English. <laughs> well, I'm a Welshman, so I'm with you there. But Oshane, absolute pleasure. Let's do this again. And as you say, if the listeners love love this episode or, or the watchers love this episode, if you want to see it again, just leave comments and we'll, we'll look to do more of this. So, Cheers, Chris. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the Torpreneur podcast. Be sure to visit torpreneur.com to join the conversation and access the show notes, including links to the resources mentioned on today's episode. This is Torpreneur.